Okay, it looks like we are at the noon hour, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Texas Mood Community of Practice ECHO. Today, we are hosting a special session on COVID-19 and its implications for outpatient medical care, including OUD management. Um, as I'm sure you've all realized, there's been a lot of information coming out. It feels like everything's changing every few hours. So we hosted this session to um, bring some expert viewpoints to all of you, but also to get some feedback and information from you about what you're experiencing in your care community. Um, so yeah, thank you again for joining us. Before we get into our introductions, I want to turn over to UT Echo IT to give just a little bit of information about your audio connection. Yes, I would like to remind all participants to mute themselves when not speaking by using the microphone icon in the lower left corner of your screen. For those on the phone to mute and unmute, press star six. These instructions will be posted in the chat box. If you have any technical problems or questions, please chat uh, UT Echo IT. Thank you so much, Matthew. And just to reiterate again, watch that chat feature for some important information. Matthew will also send out a survey link so that you can earn free CME for participating in today's session. And we'll also be sharing a few resources through that. Um, we've actually all already gotten on here some information from somebody whose audio is not working. So please know you can also use the chat feature to interact with us or to ask questions. And we'll try to keep track of those and come to them after the didactics uh, portion of the, of the day is over. One last bit, just some housekeeping. If you can, please use the chat feature to enter your name, institution, and email address. That helps us with our attendance tracking, which is very important for the overall conduct of these sessions. Before we get into didactics, I wanna introduce our team again. Um, again, my name's Andrea Roche. I'm here at UT Health San Antonio, and I will be facilitating this ECHO session. I'll turn now to Dr. King. Can you unmute and tell everybody a little bit about who you are? Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Van King. I'm an addiction uh, psychiatrist at UT Health in San Antonio, um, and uh, I'm the medical director of uh, Texas Mood, and uh, uh, happy to be here and uh, talk a little bit about uh, opioid use disorder treatment uh, in this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. King. And turning now to Dr. Berggren. Oh, Dr. Berggren, there we go. I think we have your audio now. Okay, hang on. We audio can hear you. Hi, everybody. I'm Ruth Berggren. I'm an infectious disease doc. I'm also a professor of medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Um, I direct the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics, and I have been uh, in, invited to play a unique role in San Antonio during this pandemic, um, advising the county. So that keeps me abreast of a lot of other issues uh, that are going on. Thank you, Dr. Bergen. We're really thankful for you making the time today to be with us. And then turning to the administrative support, helping today's session run smoothly, Sedona, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Sedona Kunders, and I am a research scientist with the Texas Mood team. I'm also on the hub for this ECHO. Thanks, Sedona. And Matthew. Hello, Matthew. I'm ECHO IT here, um, and I'm also a research assistant at the Opal Lab. And Cassie? Uh, good afternoon, Cassie Williams. I'm also a senior researcher in the research program and working on this ECHO projects. All right, and last but not least, Su Yen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Su Yen Shagans, and I'm a program manager here at UT Health San Antonio. Great, thank you, Su Yen. Um, Matthew, if you can go on and queue up the didactics, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Bergren. I do want to, I'll try to repeat this a couple times throughout the session, but just to let you know, if you do have any questions that aren't answered in the chat feature or in our Q&A afterwards, um, please reach out to us at the Texas Mood email address. I will put that in the chat, but I'll say it here. It's txmoud at uthscsa.edu. And you'll see that um, website pop up a couple times more in our presentation. And as I said before, this is an ever-evolving situation. And so we're, we're 
our goal is to update you with information as soon as it becomes available. Okay, Dr. Bergren, the slide should be up if you can take it away. All right, are you controlling the slides or am I? We are controlling them. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and go to the first um, inform informational slide. These are the learning objectives that we have uh, for this presentation, and I will be going over uh, some basics about COVID-19, including safety precautions, um, implication of the COVID-19 pandemic on delivery of outpatient medical care with some, some granular details. Um, hopefully won't be telling you things you already know. I certainly wanna leave time for a Q&A. And then Dr. King will talk about recommendations for treatment of opioid use disorder during the pandemic. Next slide. So here is the, the snapshot that um, maybe many of you are familiar with by now. This comes from the Johns Hopkins University website and it's our daily global snapshot reminding us that we've had over 877,000 cases that are confirmed worldwide. Of course, that's the tip of the iceberg because um, many parts of the world don't have access to testing at all um, with uh, pushing 45,000 deaths and 185,000 people who have recovered here in the US, over 190,000 cases, we've passed 4,000 deaths and 7,000 recovered. So these are just unprecedented numbers, something like we've never faced in our lifetimes. Next slide. And um, this is not the best way to capture these graphics, but this was from a really helpful New York Times article by Nicholas Kristof um, over a week ago where uh, he provided interactive modeling that looked at what the peak of the curve would look like under different scenarios. And, and what you can see is um, 100 million total infections uh, for the US with a peak of 366,000 ICU cases on the upper left, and then how that curve, if we flatten it somewhat, um, could still lead to 100 million infections, same number of infections, but far fewer ICU cases at the peak. And so that's why we're hoping uh, against hope that our measures that we're um, putting into place will flatten the curve. It's, it's alarming but necessary for people to understand that estimates are that the country has about 800,000 hospital beds and 68,000 adult ICU beds and an estimated about 170,000 ventilators you can see that in either of these two scenarios, um, it looks like we would have many, many more cases needing ICU beds um, than are available. So hence the cause for all of these measures that we're taking. Next slide. Can you see the next slide? This is a model that shows what a difference a day makes. So you're looking at um, scenarios in which a community takes no social distancing measures at all, and you can see the cumulative cases on, on the uh, y-axis there with number of days on the x-axis. And then if you look at a community that starts social distancing on day N and see that on day 20, they have 40% fewer cases than a community that started social distancing one day later. So the title of this slide should really be what a difference a day makes. Next slide. And that was a model, so big deal. We know that models can be way off, but this is historical data from our own country looking at the death rate of the 1918 flu pandemic, comparing the city of Philadelphia, which is in the dark line, and the city of St. Louis. So <clears throat> Philadelphia uh, knew about the flu outbreak, but they permitted a parade to happen um, around here, and you can see how their number of cases um, skyrocketed. Uh, St. Louis took a different approach, and when they started to see community spread, they implemented social distancing measures, and they greatly flattened not just the epidemic curve, these are actually death rates. And so it lasted a little bit longer, the curve was longer, but it was much flatter, and they never would have exceeded um, their capacity uh, to accommodate patients. Next slide. Um, and this one is not showing what I intended to show, but um, you know, if you look at the number of cases that we have now in Bear County, and you were to put an arrow where we are now um, for Bear County, vis-a-vis uh, -vis where New York City was, 
um, in on, around the 15th of March. So we're in the 200s, right, in Bear County? And um, what's important is that New York has a much greater population than Bear County. It's much more dense, but the shape of this curve is, is what we should be paying attention to. So we're at an inflection point where we should be prepared and realize that the cases are probably going to go up. And uh, you all are aware of what's been happening in Italy, uh, which has seen a very steep rise in deaths. Next slide. There we go, that's my arrow and click again. Uh, and here's the COVID deaths in Italy and the United Kingdom. And even though those two countries are two weeks apart with respect to where they stand in the epidemic, you can see that the curve in the UK is closely following that in Italy in this particular image. Now, data continue to pour in. Sometimes we get data in fits and spurts and all of these models are subject to change and, and being updated. But I think it's good to situate ourselves in the reality of what's happening in the world around us as we think about the reality of where we are and how it's impacting what we do. Next slide. And click again because there's a title that will appear. Thank you. So the title of this slide is that appropriate measures contain a rampant pandemic. So this is data from Wuhan that shows um, new coronavirus cases per day. Um, and you can see the number of cases there on the y-axis and the x-axis is showing time. So huge number of cases, of course, but the good news is they took extreme and very strict social distancing measures, uh, very significant and important protective measures inside hospitals and patient-facing areas, and look what they were able to do. Um, the numbers for the rest of the world are there in red beginning to accumulate, but we can take hope by looking at the example of China that our, our measures can make a big difference and that the uh, epidemic curve will eventually come down. In their case, they saw a pretty prompt decline in their epidemic curve. The estimates that we've been seeing for the United States uh, look longer and hope we hope flatter on a population basis, but they're certainly looking longer. Next slide. So we promised to go over some of the symptoms. I think you've been inundated. An audience like this one is sophisticated and you've probably been paying very, very close attention uh, to how the disease presents. So I won't belabor this, but these are data that are, were published in the Journal of the American Medical Association and they do reflect uh, numbers of patients with these symptoms and uh, in parentheses, the percentages and looking at uh, I guess three different groups being reported on here. Everybody gets fever, um, most get fatigue and dry cough. You can see that expectoration, meaning sputum production, is the minority, so it really is a dry cough. Dyspnea is prominent, and then sore throat, and even diarrhea can be reported, but is not particularly prominent. What's absent is a runny nose. So people that have seasonal allergies that get nervous because their nose is running and they're starting to sneeze, they can be reassured and they should be told to treat their allergies and it doesn't mean that they're about to get coronavirus. Next slide. The CDC has issued testing priorities and it is uh, at the discretion of our health department. Why? Because we have all severe shortages for testing materials. Those are being worked on. They're getting, it's getting better every day. But even as we add redundant testing methodologies in our own university hospital laboratory, we're being told of shortages on reagents. So it seems like we address uh, shortages of swabs and then the next day we find out that there's shortages of reagents. So we haven't tested nearly as much as other countries have. This has prevented us from being able to do, do good epidemiologic investigation with quarantining of, of people that are at risk or who have the disease. So given that we don't have enough tests to give them to everybody, the priorities are first for hospitalized patients and then healthcare worker facilities, excuse me, healthcare facility workers that, are, that have symptoms. Uh, clearly, if you're providing care in a hospital, um, you're at great risk for spreading this all around to very vulnerable people. And um, so you need to be tested to, so we can get you out um, of a place where you can affect others and also uh, to document that you don't have COVID and, and that you've got some other cause of a cough so we can get you back to work 
so you can provide the care that is so needed. The second priority are folks that are in long-term care facilities who have symptoms. Uh, we do have a long-term care facility, a nursing home here in San Antonio that has been, uh, is known in the media now to have been a place where there were staff as well as a, uh, as a couple of residents who are COVID infected. Um, and we are paying close attention to what's going on there, cohorting the workers, uh, and cohorting the patients so that we avoid spread, but we remain extremely concerned because we learned a lesson from looking at Seattle that folks in these long-term care facilities, much like people on the cruise ships, are, are very vulnerable. People who are over 65 and have symptoms, people with underlying conditions like hypertension, heart disease with symptoms, first responders with symptoms. We can't just send them home and tell them to uh, quarantine themselves. We need to know if they have COVID or not so we can get them back out and doing their first responder work. Priority three is, as you see there, um, notice that it does include other kinds of healthcare facility workers and first responders. And finally, individuals with mild symptoms in communities experiencing high COVID-19 hospitalizations. Now. Uh, I would like you to know that San Antonio has access to 3,500 tests a week from the federal government. It's a FEMA program called Community-Based Testing. So we've been able to expand to individuals with mild symptoms who've been referred by a healthcare provider, and they don't have to have any other characteristics such as travel, uh, geographic exposure, exposure to a known case, or be a healthcare worker or first responder. A, a person with symptoms consistent with COVID can get referred by their provider to testing, and we do have testing available for free in San Antonio at the Freeman Coliseum. Next slide. So we're not testing people who are the worried well. We're not testing people who are in quarantine and asymptomatic, but you have to have symptoms, and the fever cutoff um, for testing is greater than 100.3 degrees Fahrenheit, cough or breathlessness. Initially, last week in San Antonio, we still required symptoms plus one of those conditions that you see listed below in the light pink. Um, now it's just symptoms and a referral by a healthcare provider. And for those of you for whom this is relevant, there's the phone number uh, for the public COVID hotline where you can um, be screened by that person uh, or you can have a doctor referral and they'll get you through that. Next slide. How to protect others. Basically, wear a face mask if you're sick, clean and disinfect the areas. Now, the issue of who's wearing a face mask and where are they wearing it is rapidly evolving. Uh, as recently as the beginning of this week, we were not universally masking in University Hospital. We were doing targeted masking in the emergency room and in the ICU where there were COVID patients. But even I, as an infectious disease consultant who has been rounding daily in UHS for the last two weeks, I was not supposed to wear a mask unless I had been exposed. It turns out that I did get exposed to a patient with a diabetic foot, um, and we found out six days after our whole team had been in there that the patient tested positive, so then they masked us. Um, clearly, if you get to the point where you have this sort of thing where multiple healthcare workers have been exposed, they're not sick, they don't know if they're in the incubation period or not, you just have to put masks on everyone. So as of late yesterday afternoon, the entire university hospital, inpatient and outpatient, joined many other hospitals and UT Health's outpatient settings to um, adopt a policy of universal masking that is not with an N95 mask, it's with a procedure mask or a face mask. The rule is one mask, one person, one shift. Um, and we in infectious diseases have decided to carefully save our uncontaminated surgical masks in an envelope and leave them in our call room at the hospital in case there's a shortage and in case we get a protocol for sterilization and reuse of the procedure mask, there is a protocol for sterilization and reuse of the N95 mask. The N95 masks are only being used by people who are caring for 
known COVID patients who are coughing a lot or for providers who are doing aerosol generating procedures such as tracheal aspirations or bronchoscopy or intubation and the like. So we're conserving our N95s as much as possible. Those N95s now are getting recycled. Um, there's a place, you, you get a, an N95 mask dispensed to you by swiping your card. When you finish using it, you put it in a bag and you put it back into the system and it's, it's logged, it's kept track of. So we know uh, what are, what's happening to our inventory and we're not wasting N95 face masks. People who aren't sick, should you wear a face mask? Boy, this is evolving. And so I hesitate to say a whole lot that's definitive right now in this webinar because there are suggestions uh, in the media that the CDC may be coming out with additional guidance on wearing of face masks in public. But up until that happens, the guidance has been if you're not a healthcare worker facing a patient, um, that you wear a face mask only when you're taking care of someone who's sick and they're not able to wear a face mask. Cleaning and disinfection, I think, is being uh, messaged a lot. How well it's being followed through on, I can't. Uh, but I feel like we in healthcare need to reiterate it. You've got to clean and disinfect all these high-touch surface areas. Um, I realized to my horror yesterday after I got done doing telehealth in the call room on the ninth floor that I had picked up a telephone and started using it without personally wiping it down myself. Now it was in a, an area where I know who's been using it and I know nobody's got a fever, but it's just so hard to train ourselves to change our daily behavior and yet we have to do it and we should find ways of gently reminding one another. So if surfaces are dirty, you clean them with detergent or soap and water first prior to disinfection, and then you disinfect with something that has greater than 60% alcohol or that has bleach in it. Next slide. So what about infection control in healthcare? People who may be seeing patients in a low acuity or outpatient setting. First, we want to try to have a telemedicine and restrict visitors as much as possible. If visitors are necessary, we have to do screening of the visitors. Screening means checking the temperature with a handheld thermometer and asking a few questions about exposure. Um, we have to really monitor and manage ill healthcare personnel. And that means all healthcare personnel, whether they're ill or not. Thank you. I'm online, thank you, husband. Um, we are checking our temperature twice a day um, as healthcare personnel, whether we've been exposed or not. Then there are engineering controls that can be employed, um, such probably the closed suctioning systems is less relevant to this particular group, but physical barriers could be thought about. And so, for instance, uh, plexiglass barriers between uh, a healthcare provider and a patient could still allow them to see each other in certain instances um, and, and decrease some of the risk. I don't know how practical that is for, for this group, but, but that's something to think about. Um, and then just to reiterate what I've already said about environmental infection control practices, it's, we talk about it a lot, get, putting them into practice is much more difficult. And um, surgical masks are as good as N95s for patient care unless there's heavy coughing or if the provider is doing an aerosol producing procedure. Next slide. So you can read through this about cleaning high touch surface areas. Um, I think I've, I've already reiterated this in some detail, but any surfaces that could have any bodily fluids on them are the ones that are high priority. Next slide. And this is just uh, the slogan of the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics, which I direct. We are preparing tomorrow's healers to act with compassion and justice. I also want to share with you that we are concerned about the uh, moral distress of our healthcare providers uh, and the need to remain connected to that which makes our lives meaningful. And so in this regard, our center has created an online website called PanPals. PAN for pandemic, PALS, 
and you can reach it through www.panpals.org. We, are, we aim to have twice weekly webinars where we're discussing matters related to ethical decision making and the, the medical humanities in general. There is a blog and there's an opportunity for you to connect and to make contributions of artwork or reflections through that. And we really invite you to uh, check it out, participate if you can, and share it with others for whom this may be meaningful. Thank you very much and I'll stop. Thank you very much, Dr. Bergen. And um, for those of you who can see the chat, I just sent out the Pan Pals uh, website link, and we'll follow up with a link to the Center for Medical um, uh, Humanities and Ethics, too, if you're interested in checking that out. At this time, we'll turn it over to Dr. King for the remainder of the didactic. Matthew, can you advance the slide? Well, thank you, thank Dr. You. Parker. That was uh, that was very informative, and uh, feel like we're we're very much up to uh, up to speed now. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit uh, more specifically about how um, uh, uh, COVID nineteen may be uh, affecting um, you know, sort of routine procedures and outpatient uh, uh, management of opioid use disorder. Next, so. Um, you know, as you know, many of our patients are, are having some increased anxiety and perhaps depression, uh, um, you, you know, secondary to uh, worrying about uh, COVID. Maybe some of them, you know, know people that have had uh, an infection. Um, and uh, certainly anybody with independent anxiety disorders or depressive disorders uh, would be more prone to uh, being aff affected. I have to say, in, in the patients that I've been um, seeing in our practice, they, they seem to be handling it pretty well. Most people are following these guidelines and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, practicing the social distancing and um, really, you know, perhaps are a bit more resilient than, uh, than we were thinking. Um, we'll see it in a later slide. We, we might worry that people with drug use problems might have increases in their drug use as a way to cope. Um, and of course, you know, we're not going to be able to refer them to standard, you know, group-based kinds of uh, psychosocial treatments for their uh, substance use disorder problems. Uh, so, so basically, we uh, we have to do whatever we can with uh, people, you know, basically staying at home and uh, minimizing their social contacts. Um, we we've been seeing this in our own clinics, uh, some staffing shortages. Um, you know, uh, issues of childcare, uh, as well as um, any kind of illness, uh, uh, you know, uh, staff are going to have to stay home because we can't be certain whether or not they could be, um, uh, um, you, know, uh, you know, currently affected by uh, the COVID virus. Uh, so all this is, is really going to, um, you know, make things more difficult for us uh, taking care of our patients in the clinic. Um, now, one thing that we, we have been doing a, a, a lot of, and, and I know uh, uh, many practices have been doing, are, are more of these audio or video-based kinds of services. Um, on our uh, platform, it, it's a bit more challenging for patients uh, to use the video conferencing uh, um, uh, in Epic because uh, it, they have to have some confidence in their IT abilities, perhaps. They have to have suitable equipment and, uh, and a, a reasonable uh, internet connection. Um, however, since uh, the, the, uh, the government has uh, relaxed and, and said that it's allowable to have uh, telephone um, visits with uh, patients um, and uh, uh, potentially bill for them, uh, we've been relying a lot on telephonic uh, uh, visits with patients. Um, it seems that most uh, uh, insurance carriers are going to cover this, although there is a, a little bit of, um, uh, of controversy about whether uh, Medicare, for instance, uh, will, uh, will reimburse. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, our Medicare patients, our disabled, our elderly, are some of the people that are uh, you know, need to stay away <laughs> and outside of, of uh, social situations even more. So, so I, I think we have to just, you know, go ahead and, and do the best we can in terms of, 
of uh, our visits with them and, uh, and hope that, um, that we do get some reimbursement uh, uh, from that. Um, and so, yes, what can we, what can we do to, uh, to see these patients uh, um, and do their visits remotely? Next. Um, so, uh, and, and especially for substance use problems and psychiatric problems, uh, since uh, it, it, is, it is very helpful to be actually to see the patients, um, but uh, in many ways for an emergency uh, situation like this, um, it, you know, these kinds of telephonic uh, uh, remote uh, you know, kinds of visits are sort of our ideal for behavioral kinds of problems. So unless the person has, has, has a lot of very severe psychiatric symptoms, you, you know, you can get a lot accomplished and, and most of what you want to get accomplished, uh, even in a telephone visit. So this slide just uh, shows um, some at least self-report uh, substance use uh, um, uh, for uh, uh, patients that have gone, went through Hurricane Sandy. Uh, now, you may remember that was in 2012. Uh, it hit the eastern seaboard uh, very severely, flooded uh, a large portion of New York City, the subways, uh, it, you know, huge uh, part of, uh, of uh, the islands there. Uh, it was very, very severe. Um, so uh, they, they did a, a study looking at self-reports um, and uh, what, they, uh, what they found was that uh, if you look down here, um, for the most part, there wasn't a heck of a lot of change. There was uh, some uh, increased use. It was relatively uh, minor. Uh, there was actually some reduced use, uh, at, which may have been, you know, at least in part due to availability of, of uh, the drugs. Uh, but I think that, you know, even though this is, this is not, you know, really comparable to this pandemic. Uh, th there really isn't a whole lot of work looking at this uh, in disaster kinds of situations. Uh, but, uh, you know, perhaps it gives us a, a little bit of reassurance that, uh, that uh, patients that are, um, uh, that are in treatment uh, may have a little bit more resilience in this regard than we hope. Um, but the, they did find that, uh, um, Half of these patients in this situation uh, reported disruption in their buprenorphine supply, these uh, patients on uh, buprenorphine maintenance. Um, th that shouldn't be a, a problem in this pandemic. Uh, you know, the pharmacies are open and, and things like that. This is a much more slow moving kind of, uh, um, of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, a problem and uh, so uh, there's, there's no good reason for patients not to uh, be getting their, at least their medication treatments. Next. Um, so uh, yeah, SAMHSA, DEA, they have uh, um, updates on their websites as to uh, um, you know, helpful um, um, uh, instructions and rule changes. Um, so, this slide applies perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps there's some people in our audience that are, um, that are involved with methadone maintenance clinics. Uh, th this, uh, this slide uh, uh, applies more to those uh, because, you know, for patients on buprenorphine, it's, it's office-based, it's prescriptions. So uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, um, you know, take out medications and things like that that are more of an issue with uh, narcotic treatment programs and patients having to go to just that one uh, program in order to uh, get their medications for uh, days or weeks or, or perhaps even a month uh, if they've been very stable. Um, and it says here patients uh, that are um, that are attending methadone maintenance programs may want to go to office-based clinics instead. Uh, but that's a, a you know, for anybody that's got their waiver and has, has done those trainings, you know, that's, that's a, a, not an easy process for most people to do. So uh, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we, we wouldn't want to recommend that. Uh, next, uh, okay. Uh, um, 
So I, I think an, another thing that, uh, that we've been practicing here and that we would uh, really recommend is to, um, uh, to, to really try to, to uh, uh, rotate out your staff as much as possible if you can get way, uh, away with fewer staff in the clinic. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, the receptionists, uh, some of them are working from home. And we have um, our, uh, you know, all of our uh, electronic communications uh, synced up uh, with Jabber for, uh, uh, um, you know, quicker uh, kind of communication between the staff. Um, and uh, so uh, some are coming into the clinic because you have to have people in the clinic for a variety of reasons. But uh, as it turns out, you can get a lot of things done uh, with, uh, you know, some of the receptionists at home. Uh, the uh, psychotherapists, a lot of them can do their psychotherapy home. And we've really been having a lot of the uh, physicians as well um, uh, uh, doing even um, less complicated kinds of new patient visits at home as well as, uh, as, uh, as uh, follow-up visits for, for patients that uh, are, uh, are uh, reasonably stable. Um, we do have plans for if patients are acute or what uh, one would need to do if they, you know, for instance, need to be hospitalized, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the fewer people in the clinic uh, that are uh, in a go out and you know, potentially expose themselves, the better. Um, and uh, I guess uh, this uh, uh, last uh, uh, part here uh, refers to uh, um, this impact of the 72-hour post-exposure quarantine. I guess we didn't get into that uh, so much with Dr. Berggren's talk, but yeah, if, uh, if we believe that a person may have been exposed, then um, uh, um, that uh, it's a, basically a two-week uh, uh, kind of uh, um, you know, quarantine or separation, and uh, we wouldn't want uh, people coming uh, back to work until they were 70, 72 hours uh, post uh, resolving all of their symptoms is is my uh, is my uh, understanding, uh, but uh, if uh, if uh, uh, Dr. Bergren uh, can uh, stay with us till the end, perhaps uh, she can clarify. Yes, I'm I'm listening, and please bring this up again when it's time. I'll be happy to comment. Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that next. Um, so I think another thing that's uh, that's important to remember is that. Um, for, for patients with buprenorphine, you, you don't need to get a uh, urine test necessarily during this time. I mean, it may be something that you think is very important and, uh, um, and, and needs to be done for a particularly unstable patient. But in general, uh, you can give refills. Um, you, know, you, you don't need to have that patient come to your clinic or, uh, or um, uh, you know, have them leave their, uh, their home. Uh, um, not, uh, necessarily, unless you think it really is clinically indicated. So I think it's it's just very important to uh, uh, to remember that and to to try to uh, reduce uh, the uh, patient needing to go to the uh, to the pharmacy or or come into your office. Um, um, I, I think uh, 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 crisis stabilization, crisis intervention, other emergency services, those kinds of things are very difficult. Uh, to uh, sort of not deal with on a um, an in-person kind of, of basis, uh, we we have a um, sort of a crisis intervention uh, um, uh, service here in our clinic, which typically occurs in a, a a place called the living room, which is a sort of a comfortable uh, space. Uh, but even with that, we've uh, um, you know for patients that are needing some crisis intervention, uh, we may have them. Uh, uh, speak with a uh, remotely uh, to a um, uh, staff member at home uh, as opposed to uh, having an in-person visit. Uh, again, all in the service of reducing people's exposure to each other. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, we, we, uh, you know, most of us can't shut down our operations. We still need to be seeing patients that, are, uh, that have appointments and are expecting to be seen. Um, in, our, in our case, we see a lot of patients coming out of the hospitals and the emergency rooms that have more urgent kinds of need, if not emergent. And so uh, 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 for some of them, we're able to, uh, if they're not uh, very acute and uh, 
believe they can give a good accounting of themselves. We're seeing them remotely. Uh, but some of them we are uh, um, you know, seeing in the, uh, in the, uh, in the office. Uh, unfortunately, many of these patients uh, you know, are uninsured or, or even relatively indigent. Some of them are living at Haven for Hope and so don't necessarily have a, a good telephone or a way to communicate with. Uh, so we have to be uh, um, uh, available for, for those uh, folks as well. Um, I, I, um, I don't know if any, yeah, I, I would think that even for patients that are uh, mandated to treatment uh, legally, I uh, um, think uh, there would probably be uh, some exceptions made. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, in the clinics of the, uh, uh, of the uh, providers that are on our call here today. I know in our drug court, uh, they're really not uh, seeing any of the patients in the drug court right now. They're doing all of their visits telephonically, and uh, many of the patients have on um, uh, uh, patches to detect their drug use as opposed to leaving urine samples. So they're doing everything they can to, uh, you know, continue it, uh, monitoring and continuing having uh, um, uh, uh, their uh, their monitoring function with uh, with these uh, um, uh, mandated uh, drug court patients, uh, yet uh, uh, reducing the uh, amount of exposure to uh, other folks. Um, I think it, uh, another thing that's important is even though we're changing some of uh, the rules, we're relaxing some of, of these rules, uh, uh, um, it's important that we really continue to document well um, you know, on your note, if you're seeing a person telephonically, you want to uh, you know, make sure you're writing a, a, a statement to that effect, uh, not only for insurance purposes, but also to accurately uh, record what, uh, what you did. Um, uh, um, up until uh, yesterday, uh, they, had, um, uh, um, they had waived the in-person requirement for evaluating patients for Suboxone treatment. Uh, that was a, uh, a requirement that every patient had to be seen at least once in person by the uh, provider that was going to do it, even if they were going to do uh, video uh, visits after that. But yesterday, a new um, uh, ruling came out uh, from the DEA that, would, that temporarily waived even that. So if uh, it seems clinically indicated, uh, providers that are, uh, have a buprenorphine waiver can induct uh, patients uh, over the phone uh, and call them in a prescription for um, for buprenorphine um, uh, uh, treatment. So uh, um, it's just uh, important to know that we've basically got a maximum amount of flexibility now to uh, uh, to help people that uh, um, uh, with opioid use disorder that uh, that uh, are interested in, in getting into treatment even now. And of course, uh, um, we, we want to be as as careful as possible with uh, our patients' uh, uh, privacy and rights. Uh, you know, we, we can uh, bend the HIPAA rules to a certain extent, but uh, we, we only want to be doing these things uh, with the patient's knowledge and, and, uh, and in service of their uh, best health. Next. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is the Ryan Hate Act is the, uh, is the act that uh, that says that uh, practitioners have to have an in-person medical evaluation before they can uh, uh, prescribe the controlled substance. But uh, again, this uh, is currently waived. Next. Um, so uh, just to mention, uh, you know, many of us have been on Zoom. We're on it right now. <laughs> uh, it, this Zoom for Healthcare is HIPAA compliant um, and uh, video. Uh, so uh, there's, there's various ways uh, to be HIPAA compliant and uh, still see your patients uh, um, uh, from in a remote uh, way. Um, at least for our institution, we can't use uh, FaceTime or non-approved uh, video uh, communication. Uh, it, you should uh, follow uh, the uh, dictates of your system. Um, and, um, Okay, and uh, j just again, you know, these documentation restrictions of signed consent and 42 CFR. Again, I think if, if it's in the best service of the patient and the patient agrees, uh, you, you know, I, uh, we, we can get, go ahead and get that signed uh, consent at some later time 
uh, to uh, reduce their exposure to others in the community. Next. Uh, and uh, this is just the, uh, um, uh, uh, a uh, screenshot of the, uh, the DEA telemedicine uh, um, uh, blur. Next. Um, so uh, I think another thing to consider is if uh, you believe your program might end up being closed or you're changing your hours of operation, uh, you know, how are you going to communicate that to your, uh, to your patients so that they know? Uh, you know, we know in the hospital they're closing certain entrances and limiting the ways that people can get in. Uh, are, is that going to apply to your uh, situation? Do, you, do the patients need to know so they're not having to walk a block or, or around the uh, the um, the, the, um, the hospital or the clinic to get in? Um, and uh, um, you know, of course, uh, uh, you know, we have tables set up where people are. Uh, you know, either donning masks and, and, uh, and uh, gelling their hands and everything like that. Do we want to limit walk-in appointments if, uh, if that happens? So all these kinds of things we need to be able to communicate to our patients so that they uh, uh, know how to get their care. Next. So uh, as I was uh, Saying at the beginning, I think it's worthwhile uh, uh, checking in with our patients specifically about uh, COVID. Maybe they're, you know, they may be bringing it up uh, before you do. Uh, I've found that I'm usually the first one to bring it up and patients are telling me how they're dealing with it. Uh, but certainly we want to uh, make sure that we're paying attention to that and, and maybe even considering uh, touching base with them a little bit more frequently. Uh, you know, maybe this is uh, a patient you're typically uh, speaking you know, monthly, maybe they need uh, uh, you know check-ins a little bit more frequently now, especially those that don't have a lot of social support and uh, can't get out of the house. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, next. Okay. And these are just some uh, online resources. Uh, SAMHSA's updating their coronavirus and the DAs um, uh, also is updating their uh, guidance and uh, those are worthwhile visiting um, just to uh, make sure we're up with the most uh, recent uh, uh, rules. I think that's the end. I think it is too and um, we have a question here we want to pose to all of you to try to drive some discussion in our remaining um, in our remaining time together. Um, and that's just you one, do you have questions about the information that's presented to you, but also to hear from you all how your clinic or your care contact is adapting to COVID-19. Um, before we get to that, I do want to give the Texas Mood team a little bit of time to tell you what's on the landscape with their program. So I'll turn it over to Sedona. Matthew, would you mind sharing the announcement slides, please? And while Matthew is doing that, I want to read an exchange that happened on um, on the chat. So uh, Tim Reed wrote to everyone, ASAM recommended exploring, quote, drug testing at a distance alternatives and what options have you explored for those physicians who may want to continue remotely uh, monitoring? And uh, we had another um, thing come in after that. Um, I'm looking into set, this is from CRISPA. I'm looking into setting up at uh, telemed, a telemed view clinic and had considered having my RN do telehealth observed dosing and pill count as we would have done at the clinic. It's not drug screening, but it's a little extra documentation that patients are taking their medications. So um, thank you for that uh, feedback, CRISPA. And if others have thoughts on what Tim mentioned in the chat, please bring those up. But um, let's put that off for just a second and turn it over to Sedona, who can tell us what's coming up with the Texas Moon program. Hello, everyone. So uh, today's echo was a little different, but we'd love to see you again in our other echoes, which are typically on the third Tuesday of each month at the same time from noon to one. Uh, Matthew, can you go to the next slide? And the Texas Medication for Opioid Use Disorder program at UT Health San Antonio also offers DEA X waiver trainings and technical assistance um, for providers treat opioid use disorder. We also have TTOR funding available for those who would like funding for buprenorphine or extended release naltrexone. 
um, for patients who are otherwise unable to pay. Next slide, Matthew. And our upcoming ECHO topics include stigma, risk reduction, and neonatal abstinence syndrome. So as I said before, we'd love to see you again in our future ECHO sessions. Next slide. We also are still doing our DEA X waiver trainings. We do have the option to do these virtually. Uh, we did our first virtual session last Saturday and it went really well. So if you're interested in having a virtual X waiver training, definitely reach out to us. We also are still planning to do in-person trainings in June as well. Next slide. And if any of you have registered for the San Antonio Substance Use Symposium, which is our annual symposium, it has been postponed. So visit the SASIS website for more information on that. And I think that's it for now. Uh, we can move on to Q&A. Great, thank you so much. And in that time, um, looks like Christopher Lopez chatted a question to the group that maybe we could start with. Is there any emergency funding for persons who lost their employment and can't afford, afford their medication? I'll open that up to the larger network if anybody has a response. I, I can't say that I'm aware of anything uh, uh, specific for that. Okay, thank you. And um, Christopher, we'll also do a, a bit of looking into that and see if we can get you a, a firmed up answer and response after the session. Um, could, uh, okay, could, are there any? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. I was going to say maybe Dr. Berger could answer that uh, question about the, uh, um, you know, when, when people have either been exposed or if they've been ill and, uh, you know, when they can, you, you know, when they've recovered, when they can, you know, go back to work and, uh, Go back into uh, or back into society. Okay, thank you for the question. So first, let me give you for a frame of reference what our current standard of care is in the hospital environment. We are no longer quarantining healthcare workers that have been exposed. So if you're exposed and you're asymptomatic, you become like what I have been for the last two weeks. You go to work every day, you put your mask on and you monitor your temperature twice a day. And it's, that is in, in our context, incredibly necessary for the preservation of the workforce. Because as, as this time goes on, there are more and more and more people who can point to an exposure. Um, and it's not that they're fabricating it, that's just the reality of the epidemic. And so if you quarantine every healthcare worker that's had an exposure, um, you're, you're going to just decimate your healthcare workforce. So I, I think that people who are in uh, mental health and substance use treatment are critical, critical in this time period. And I would, I would think that that standard would apply to you all as well. Um, now, then comes the question of if you've been placed in isolation, what then? And if you're known or presumed COVID positive, you have to keep isolated for seven days, seven days, and plus three days of no fever. Okay, so you have to fulfill the criteria of you've been, you've been out of circulation and isolated for seven days since the time of the onset of symptoms. At the end of seven days, if you haven't had a period of afebrility, you need to start, you know, continue your isolation until you're afebrile for 72 hours. You may be coughing still after that, you put on a mask and you back out. Um, a symptomatic healthcare worker is a priority person to be tested for COVID. So by all means, get to the front of the line. There's actually a separate line in the public testing site for symptomatic healthcare workers so that we can get their results back and get them back to work as soon as we know that the results are negative. Does that help? Yes, very much, thank you. Um, and it looks like Tim Reed um, was, was, is asking specifically you, Dr. King, um, about the comment in the chat, um, ASAM's recommendations for exploring drug testing at a distance alternative. Um, have you explored, um, what options have you explored for physicians who may want to continue remotely monitoring? Uh, well, that is a very good question. And um, 
I, I think in my own practice, I don't have anybody that I'm so worried about that I think I need to get a, a urine on them right now. Um, I'm not sure, is, does any, is anybody aware that uh, like Quest or one of these uh, um, testing facilities might be available to do that? Um, it's always, a, it, you know, you, you'd like to be relatively confident that what the sample that the person is submitting is actually their own. Um, so just sending them someplace to leave a sample you know, could easily be falsified or something like that. I think from my point of view, during this kind of, you know, infectious disease, you know, urgency, emergency, um, it's more important that patients continue to get their medications uh, to uh, um, prevent overdose and to, uh, you know, make sure that they don't become destabilized um, rather than, you um, uh, getting, uh, um, you, know, you know, urine drug screens. Um, I, I think that, um, uh, I don't know if, if anybody's got any, it, it, I had quite frankly, I hadn't even thought about uh, um, remote uh, um, testing. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else would have some, uh, some ideas about that. It just seems like it's quite, uh, it's quite involved and you know, unless it was already set up, it would take a while to uh, set up, uh, um, you know, some kind of protocol like that. Let's open it up. Does anybody else have feedback on how they're, they're tackling that? Tim, it looks like you might be able to chime in. Are you um, able to unmute? Hi there. Yes, this is Tim. Uh, speaking, um, I, I was the one who posed the question, Dr. King. Um, it is obviously, I, I will be upfront in saying I do work uh, for a company that uh, specializes in some telehealth remote solutions. Um, so I have wanted to join the conversation just to hear um, from the addiction professionals about what, what you have explored because the ASAM guidelines although were helpful, were kind of quite ambiguous. Um, I know okay, I can't, um, I, I know I can't speak to a particular company, so I'm not, but all I would say is yes, there are solutions and yes, there are solutions to uh, authenticate the sample, a urine sample to the patient via DNA. I won't say anything about the company or anything like that, but yes, there are solutions and they can be, can be implemented within 48 hours and that's all I'll say. Great. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate you. Uh, well, as, as I said, it's, it's relatively complicated <laughs> and uh, you, you know, you, you'd have to, you'd have to be, um, you'd basically have to be signed up for that particular, uh, you know, that particular type of treatment in order to access that. But, uh, um, you know that that's uh, that that's uh, very interesting. We're, we're just just the technology again. I'm not going to say anything, but our, the technology has been available to physicians for over two years. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, the logistical side of things can be handled if that is a concern. Great, thank you, Tim. And I would say if anybody is interested in that, you can directly chat Tim. Please, you can privately chat him or something like that. Um, Let's open up the floor to some other questions we might have. I think I saw Krispa. Um, I'll lower your hand. Are you able to unmute and raise your question or comment? Well, I just wanted to say, um, I heard in another telehealth um, um, MAT webinar that there actually is a, um, like a, a saliva of, um, your screening that you can mail to the patient and they do it in front of you by telehealth and you can see the results so they would put their saliva into the into the device and show you their results right there in real time um, but I imagine they're probably pretty pricey and um, they're not CLIA waived so but um, that was something that another um, expert had recommended to do um, telehealth um, drug screening yeah, I, I, and that makes that that's reasonable. Again, um, these would 
I assume would be people that you know have video conferencing available or, or are doing that on some kind of regular basis already. Uh, and um, yeah, it can be helpful. I think in, in this kind of situation, uh, as uh, Tim pointed out, uh, it is relatively ambiguous how often one uh, needs to get um, uh, uh, urine drug screens or, or drug screens on patients. And um, unless the person is particularly unstable, you're particularly worried about um, their self-report or whatever, um, it's, it's okay to forego uh, formal testing right now and just go on their self-report. Um, you know, until we get on the other side of this uh, uh, pandemic. Well, what I worry about more is, is starting new patients on buprenorphine via telehealth, um, which ideally we should be doing to increase the number of people in treatment to keep them out of the ED and out of the hospital for their opioid use disorder. So um, Texas is certainly under, uh, does not have enough buprenorphine providers Still, and we, we also have our opioid epidemic that um, we need to treat as many people as possible. Yeah. Well, you know, if you have collateral that they were recently in the hospital or, or you know, you're, you're convinced that they have, a, you know, an ongoing uh, history of opiate use disorder, I mean, those are the kind of patients that, uh, uh, that you'd feel, you know, relatively comfortable starting on. Um, you know, with this uh, relaxation in the uh, in the rules, uh, maybe not you know either telephonically or or, or video, uh, without an in person um, without an in person uh, visit. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. It's uh, it, it's it's uh, it's something that would be uh, you'd want to have soon if you didn't have it right. Thank you. And I want to turn now to Dr. Berggren. If you're on the chat, you'll see um, that she has some insight from an experience with Hurricane Katrina. Dr. Berggren, and I should say, just a caveat, I know we're a couple minutes past the hour, but um, we want to answer your questions. So we appreciate those of you who stay on, but understand if those of you need to, need to leave. Um, we'll try to wrap up, though, in a few minutes. And if there are any questions you've entered in the chat that we haven't gotten to, the Texas Mood team will be responding to those uh, with to those questions with some answers um, by the end of the day. So thank you very much. All right, Dr. Bergen, go ahead. Okay, so um, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I had both the the trauma as well as the privilege of being inside Charity Hospital in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina and for the week following Katrina. And I will give you my firsthand testimonial witness that we had people shooting at doctors and nurses who were trying to evacuate patients out to get them out of charity. Um, it was incomprehensible to me why someone would come and shoot at a hospital. And it was so incomprehensible to the rest of the country that, that people uh, didn't disbelieved us for a time. I don't know who was shooting at us, but I have to think that these were people who were desperate for something, um, food or maybe drugs. And why would they go to a hospital? And so um, when people feel that they are in the depths of despair, uh, that they feel or they perceive that the world is coming to an end, uh, we see this kind of dehumanized behavior. And I cannot stress enough how glad I am that you all as professionals are uh, staying in this fight. It is a war that we're fighting against COVID. And I can't stress enough how important your work is. And mental health and substance use, I think are key areas. They always get, I think, underfunded and underattended to. And we're looking at a very prolonged period of social distancing measures, all the models that keep being shared are, are alarmingly long, looking at peaks in May, June, or even for San Antonio, a possible peak in July. I don't know whether to believe that or not, but it's coming from credible sources within the university. And already today I'm hearing from fellow physicians, um, things like, you've got to be kidding me. Please don't even tell us that. We're going to lose hope. We don't want to hear um, how long this could go on. 
So um, I just urge you all to keep up what you're doing. I can't, I can't stress how important it is. You know this, but I, I just want you to hear it kind of from my heart and my, my personal experience. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that and for the, the context, but also um, some motivation in, in this very difficult time. Um, I think I want to move now to just wrapping up. And one last bit, Chris Lopez, if you're watching on the chat, um, looks like Rick Green may have also posed, um, posed an answer to your question. Just any, any chance the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association will expand the patient in need programs as people can't afford their meds due to unemployment. Um, maybe not the 100% the, the answer you were, you were looking for, but maybe an idea of where to look next. Um, Dr. King, to help us wrap up, would you mind just kind of reiterating what you see as the key points from our session today? <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll give you well, a very little time. You know, I, I think the, the bottom line for me is, you know, patients, you, you, you know, on, for, that are receiving their opioid use disorder treatment in an outpatient setting, we, we, they should just be treated like any other patients in the outpatient setting, right? I mean, you're doing the best you can. Let's keep people safe. Let's do as many remote visits as possible. Let's not do unnecessary testing. You know, I, I agree that it's, it's great to be able to, to do all the, the uh, um, evaluation that, you, that you'd prefer to do, but uh, this is this is going to be, you know, perhaps extended, but uh, you know, it, it is go going. It's a finite period of time, and let's just uh, try our best to keep people, you know, stable and, uh, you know, on their medicines. Uh, you know, I'm giving uh, um, take-home doses. I'm doing uh, uh, telephone check-ins, uh, but um, you know, uh, um, ensuring that people have, uh, you know, the medicines that they need over the period of time that. Uh, and um, you know when I'm you know more confident that we'll be able to have in-person sessions, um, and uh, you know practicing the social distancing, I think is is the thing that makes the most uh, uh, the most uh, uh, um, you know well practicing the social distancing, uh, washing your hands, uh, uh, you know as often as possible. I guess we're wearing masks now. I mean everything that they're telling you to do on TV, let's do it, um, and. Uh, and uh, just minimize this so we can get back to uh, you know seeing patients in our office as soon as possible. Um, that's what I would say, Doctor uh, Doctor Bergren. Any uh, any things from your point of view uh, as an infectious disease specialist, uh, especially around people's office uh, um, uh, based uh, interactions with folks? Yeah, no, I I think that um, just follow these guidelines to a letter. Do telemedicine when you can. Um, and then just hang in there and just believe that what this is so important. Um, and there's one more helpful thing, really. I, I, hang on, I hung on to this for six days and nights in a very dark place inside charity in New Orleans with floods all around. Um, we were told every morning at Human Resources, we may not be able to control what's happening to us, but we can control how we treat one another. And that was life-saving, really. And it's something positive to share. And you can share it with each other, take care of each other, and share it with your clients and your patients. Thank you very much. And again, we're recording this session. I've listed the um, I've listed the YouTube account that we will be posting the recording of the session on, and we will follow up with any um, resources mentioned in this call today. I want to thank Dr. Berger and Dr. King for all the work they did to prepare for today's presentation, as well as the Texas Mood team to arrange everything and pull this off smoothly. Um, again, we're so thankful you've taken the time to be with us today. If you have any, any questions um, and in this ever-evolving landscape of responding to COVID-19 and maintaining uh, clinical care and care for yourselves in this time, please reach out to the Texas Mood team. You can find more information at txmood.org as well as an email link there. Um, we hope to see you at our upcoming sessions and uh, don't be a stranger. Everybody, please be well. Bye-bye.